Chapter One of the Pathway of the Pioneer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pathway of the Pioneer by Dolph Willard. Chapter One. We have done with hope and honor. We are lost to love and truth. We are slipping down the ladder, rung by rung, and the measure of our torment is the measure of our youth. God help us, for we knew the worst too young. Rudyard Kipling flare caldecott turned on the gas and pushed the chairs into position then she let down the blind and shut out the roaring march evening and the brown twilight the night seemed full of wind and fluttering leaves even in this little side street where trees were not the women's skirts flapped as they passed and the men had to hold on their hats passers-by were few but those who came in sight battled with the wind and said in dumb show that it was well to be indoors it was cold in the bare room as well as in the streets even though a large stove had been burning for an hour the gas lamp would help so flare turned it up full and it revealed every detail of the unusual furnishing searching into distant corners and displaying three large packing cases with straw protruding through the spaces between the boards as if some one were perpetually moving house besides the packing cases there were seven chairs of no resemblance at all to each other which appeared to have been forcibly gathered together rather than naturally associated there was also a bare deal table on which lay a large dictionary and some typewritten sheets the fifth chapter of flair's last story which she was correcting while waiting for the assembling of nuzotra for she could not afford to waste time a rug had been laid on the oilclothed floor before the half circle of the seven chairs and on one of the forlorn packing cases was an old drawing board converting it into a sideboard to carry a siphon of soda water a bottle of cheap claret and half a bottle of whiskey there were cigarettes and matches on the mantel-shelf this completed the furnishing the room had two doors to it one leading into a long passage and thence to the entrance of the house the other to a small dressing-room where every time that the society met flare carried her own lamp and hung up a square of looking-glass she also provided a towel soap and a brush and comb from her own bedroom which was up six flights of stairs at the top of the gaunt echoing building and when the meeting was over and she was tired and wanted to get into bed she had most of these things to convey up the six flights again which necessitated two if not three journeys before she could do so it being a stipulation to her use of the empty room with the packing cases that she should leave it as she found it the door which led into the passage had a strip of cardboard some two feet wide hanging from a nail on the inner side and black lettered like a label nuzotra this also flare removed after each irregular meeting of the society to which she belonged by election of circumstances which is the only ballot known to nuzotra there was an air of watchfulness and expectancy about the girl as she stood reading the typed sheets by the table which seemed habitual to her but none the less wearying it was as if she set a dreadful guard upon herself that could not be laid aside even when she slept for fear of being taken unawares in a dream once she raised her head from the sheet as she turned it and looked down the long room as a sentry might look up and down his beat and her eyes were haunted by a shadow of some threatened fear in their momentary expression but it was only when she was alone that the expectancy took possession of the young face at a sound of approaching voices and steps it had vanished and flare turned to meet her friends who had never seen the former look nor knew of its existence the door with the label opened almost before some one tapped to admit first an exclamation and then two girls there ye are dear we're just clemmed there's plenty wind to-night uh 
I'm so blown about, I'm just a tatty bogle. Through the high, sweet voice ran an accompaniment of merriment, not a full laugh, only the soul of it, and the speaker stooped and offered Flair a cold cheek, as soft and pink as the heart of a wild rose. Something of the wild rose was in her slender, swaying figure, too, a most unbritish grace, a haunting memory of France and the carriage of her women. Yet the voice came from the North Country. An east wind, is it? said Flair. That accounts for my skin playing me tricks. It feels like a nutmeg grater. Where did you meet Alma? On the doorstep, using the most awful swear words, dear. Mrs. Bonnet let us in. She joined us on the doorstep, too, with plenty parcels. Oh, it was a kind of at-home on the doorstep, and Alma was so cross with the wind, I could do nothing but laugh. The voice trailed off into its irresistible, provoking merriment, and the hearers laughed, too, because Winnie Dare carried the spirit of mirth with her wherever she came. She had laughed through hunger and despair and illness, and whenever fortune did not hit her heavily at the moment, she staked her buoyant vitality with the born instinct of the gambler. Tomorrow she would suffer again, for today she found something to laugh at, though half pitifully. I do hate wind, said the smaller girl, who had entered with her, loosening a fine wool wrap that had been twisted round her neck and over her mouth. Flare took it from her gently, and laid her face a shade more tenderly against the one revealed. How's the cough, Alma? she said. Better. I must be well by next week. We sing for the merry milkmaid to-morrow, and if I get in, we rehearse at once. May I go and take my hat off and clean up, Flare? I'm so dirty. Yes, of course. Where have you come from, then? Haven't you been home for a meal? I borrowed a cup of tea with Hilda, said Alma, simply, crossing the long space to the dressing-room at Winnie's heels. As they went, they passed the packing-case and its refreshments. Have a drink? said Flair hospitably. Alma laughed and declined. Winnie laughed and accepted. She lingered to mix herself a small portion of whiskey and soda, Flair looking on with comprehension. Have you had any meals today, Winnie? she said in a slightly desperate tone. The rose-hued face turned to her brightly. The hazel-gray eyes smiled with love. For the minute, Winnie Dare was at her prettiest. I lunched out, dear, she said with a little nod and in a lower tone oh said flair accepting the confidence and attempting no comment winnie did not lunch alone then well but if it had not happened she might not have lunched at all did he turn up at the office she asked because it was not good to drop a confidence amongst nous autres be it never so slight there might come a day when there was no information offered and that, in Flair's experience, preceded disaster. She never upbraided, and she never washed her hands of the responsibility, and said, Don't tell me, then. She listened. It was the only help she could offer to all her friends alike. He sent up a message. I don't know what Mr. Jennings thinks. And I joined him outside. Winnie laughed again. Life often amused her, even when she was staking it most recklessly. How is the Jennings man? Far too civil. He is a beast. Most employers are, said Flair, out of the ugliness of her experience. Did he kiss his hand to you this time, when you left to lunch with somebody? No, the second clerk was in the office. I wonder what these firms engage a typist for, to add a little excitement to the manager's business day, I sometimes think. The Jennings man told me I had a lovely figure yesterday, and I told him I should be glad if he would go away and not interrupt my work. I am getting positively rude to him, though he is my employer, and I don't see how to alter it. It would be a nuisance if you had to leave. I can't, dear. I simply daren't. When should I get anything else? And somebody is getting so jealous. He threatens to come up to the office and speak to Jennings for me. There will be plenty rows, dear. What am I to do with them? Hm, 
said flair dryly i'll think hurry up winnie there's the doorbell it's frank most likely but as the last frill of winnie's skirt vanished into the further room the door was pushed open to admit a guest of the society who though always welcome was not one of them being a very large very handsome cat he was what is technically called a black tabby the groundwork of his coat being black with grey markings like watered silk which hardly showed in some lights he was not at any time a black cat however his singularly broad nose being distinctly brown and the bracelets round his neck standing out against lighter fur he entered with the air of a man with his hands in his pockets lounged across the room paused at the table and after measuring the space as cats do sprang with perfect aim and balance on to flair's manuscript she did not attempt a protest but she did make a hurried note of thanksgiving that the streets were dry because most of her manuscript bore the cat's sign manual in four toe smudges when he had been out walking on a muddy day and came straight into her domains he was originally the property of mrs bonnet flair's landlady who tolerated him because he never mewed except in dire necessity and did not desire to be nursed when flair drifted into the two small rooms at the top of the house the cat made her acquaintance and when mrs bonnet cooked her a chop she secretly kept him the tail flair was strictly honest had she been examined over the subject she would have said that he was her landlady's cat but in the tenderness of her heart she knew that they would share their last scraps together and it sometimes came to counting the pence nous ultra knew it too and acknowledged him he attended all their meetings and by now wore a collar on whose plate was engraved his name and address my sakes miss said mrs bonnet you don't suppose as anybody would want to steal him why the neighbourhood's so full of cats the trouble is not to have one no one's likely to want another flair dodged the question feeling herself weak nevertheless the cat wore his collar and gained the respect of the street in consequence his name would have astonished a finder had he really strayed and they had seen it for flair had not had her own or mrs bonnet's engraved above the address the cat's own title was plainly to be read though it must be owned between inverted commas his name was r l stevenson flair had christened him for the pleasure of daily addressing a household deity and as he had never had another he accepted it without question nous ultra called him r l for short he had flourished on the tails of flair's chops and having had some original beauty to develop warranted in some sort the fear in flair's mind that had resulted in his wearing a collar as he sat upon the manuscript with his solemn face and wonderful eyes turned on flair he looked like a monument of tabby fur but he was undeniably handsome the relations between them were obvious from the way in which he thrust his blunt nose into her hand as she stood beside him and rubbed a wet muzzle softly on her palm pretty old kitten said flair softly and with foolish flattery for the enormous tom would have made six kittens by the time that winnie and alma had done gossiping and cleaning up the remainder of the society had arrived and proceeded to assemble one girl after another filing out to take off her hat and returning to drop into the chair which was her own by custom they represented pretty collectively the professions open to women of no deliberate training some education and too much delicacy for the fight before them hilda romaine of the ladies catgut band may stand for music she played in a very successful feminine orchestra at halls and amateur entertainments whereby the conductor began a successful career and the members usually starved if they did not marry frank peyton was of his majesty's telegraph extension department 
in his majesty's post office a government official please on twenty-eight shillings a week working eight hours a day and half the nights at exams if she wanted more salary magda burke was art editor and journalist with the chance of dismissal at the proprietor's pleasure at a week's notice we give no characters in journalism dismissal spells failure but the causes will not bear recording because they usually reflect on those in authority not on those employed alma craik actress with seven years experience behind her and glad to take thirty shillings a week and walk on she had no influence and no figure she played old women and boys as an artist but the stage wants legs and private means beatrice barley music teacher and preparatory mistress in a second-rate private school because her qualifications were not quite sufficient for a high school beatrice held two medals for music and had taken scholarships but after a struggle through her matric she had never had either money health or time for the inter which she might have passed more easily and that barred the letters to her name her gifts were unluckily social which are no good in the labour market winifred dare typist and shorthand clerk in a situation found for her by the firm which had taught her and which if she refused or threw it up would find her no more the less said about the situation the better as witness the gentleman who kissed his hand to her and admired her figure and flair caldicott fictionist freelance journalist reporter literary hack of all kinds who lived on whatever work she could get and had neither illusions nor ideals left from eight years of honest work they were all heaven help them the daughters of professional men who with the lack of responsibility peculiar to their generation had had families for whom they had not the least intention to provide then they had partially failed sometimes utterly and died leaving their daughters an inheritance of refinement that was nothing but a handicap for the professions entail a certain amount of education and money and these again presuppose means that rank the holders among the upper middle classes families whose women at least have been trained in a degree of idleness of sheltered home life of all the instincts and tastes that belong to the leisured classes then comes a new order of things that forces the new generation to stand on its own feet and the girl who inherits her father's and mother's qualities finds herself suddenly thrust on to the lower plane of the workman's daughter to compete with a coarser physique a less sensitive mind and more capable qualities for the labour that both must gain or starve the workman's daughter is coming up to meet the professional man's daughter coming down they meet on a mid-level and the one brings push to match the other's brains the more refined animal is at a disadvantage because she has lost her own sphere and does not take kindly to the lower she is neither fish flesh fowl nor good red herring then she becomes one of nous autres who are the outsiders of life and like all pioneers is lost without record for the good of a future of which she knows nothing and which being a woman it is no comfort to her to contemplate have you ever seen in the handsome cabs of london some poor sorry hack which looks as if it were only held up by the shafts to get through its daily work yet which compared with the stronger clumsier roadster trotting sluggishly by still shows signs of breeding the cabmen usually prefer an old broken-down hunter or a half-breed with some blood in him however worn out to the nearer relations of the cart-horse for they still have the mouth that can feel a bit and the instinctive pride that seems to make them willing to go until the patient hearts mercifully break and there is another loss for the cab-owner nous autres 
are very like the broken-down hunter they cannot quite forget the gentle breeding and they pull at the collar until they drop and die in the open road stumbling the last half-mile perhaps but going game to the last there was plenty of diversity in the seven faces gathered in a broken circle in the long bare room but there was not much beauty the life they had led for some years had worn it away and left the eager fighting look of young men who have their own way to make in the world those who might have been the ordinary pretty girl of the upper middle class had lost their attributes of round curves and colour and bright expressions something also of that intangible feminine quality which expects attention from the world at large merely because it is feminine the anxiety about bread and butter soon destroys that look nous autres learn that they are not likely to be spoiled by the men who look upon them simply as rivals most fortunately handicapped by sex but certainly not rendered more attractive by it and if such consideration is offered them it is a danger signal rather than a gracious tribute the day of chivalry is over and its outward courtesies are only put to an ignoble use for a motive too ugly to be acknowledged when magda met with indulgence or alma was treated with humanity both girls had learned to be on their guard for a compensating demand on their personal attractions it gave all the young faces a shadow of suspicion a certain alertness that was apt to harden into defence before a man's eyes it takes very emphatic beauty to survive the experience of such a training hilda romaine was the only girl amongst them who could be always called pretty in spite of fatigue and ill-health and disheartenment but hilda would have been exceptional in any sphere of life she belonged to no race and no climate though she had often passed for typically english with mistaken critics if you look in the british museum amongst the antique sculpture you will find many nameless women's heads with hilda's profile save that their lips are too coarse but the lovely line of forehead nose and cheek that is called greek was exactly reproduced in her and the generous width between the eyes and the grand brows she had too a curious droop of the head from the neck which threw her head into the loveliest pose though she did not stoop at all nor was she bent by desk work like magda or flair or frank to the fined down greek features she had the added beauty of colouring her hair was the true golden brown that shines like the glossy coat of a thoroughbred horse her skin was still a complexion in spite of the london air and her eyes were very blue even across a room they kept their colour magda whose hair was the fair brown of many northern races whose face was usually pale and her eyes only blue when she was happy and grey when she was sad was far more typically english the hesitating colours of its skies and sunshine seemed to be reflected in her delicacy but hilda was as warmly painted as if she hailed from the tropics the talk to-night was desultory because most of the girls were tired frank and hilda were not smoking not because they could not but because they did not particularly care for it the rest of the society were doing their best to thicken the atmosphere and make r l cough he turned his broad back on them presently in deep disapproval and went to sleep on flair's story regardless of blandishments it was penal to talk shop but flair nearly earned a forfeit by turning to winnie instinctively are they knocking your market to bits in the athenium she said i know said winnie disgustedly eightpence per thou isn't it no one could possibly live dear how can they expect decent work well if i do have to put out 
I never expect anything but the regular rates. I wouldn't trust the lower wage, said Flair thoughtfully. It was a subject that interested both of them, Winnie as labor and Flair as capital, when, as she said, she had to put work out. Order, order, Frank called across the group. Flair, what are you thinking about? Sorry, said Flair penitently. I forgot. What's the last from the city, Frank? Listen, this is what I heard at lunch today. A little boy went to have his tooth out, and he asked the dentist to give it to him afterwards, because it had been so painful when in his head. Well, my little man, said the dentist, I should think you wouldn't want to keep it on that very account. What will you do with it? Oh, please, sir, I shall wash it very carefully, and take it down to tea, and put it on a plate, and cover it with cake and jam, and watch it ache. She ended with a chuckle of intense joy, and Hilda followed her lead with the swift, sarcastic ripple that chimed against Winnie's mirth. It did not take more to amuse them than it does other girls. Have you, any of you, ever seen Flair's dentist? said Magda with intentional malice. She told me he was good-looking, and took me a long journey out to Bayswater to see him the last time she had her teeth looked over. I felt inclined to demand my omnibus fare back from her. He was the most cadaverous-looking person you ever saw. Well, there, I said, where is the handsome man? I am beginning to know Magda's ideal, drawled Flair in retort, clasping her hands behind her curly head. He is the sort of man who wants to make love to you immediately after breakfast, and tells you to put your hair back from your forehead. How dare you? magda said laughing i should like to see any man interfere with my personal appearance an earl's court exhibition kind of man went on flair dreamily he will take her out there in the evenings for her sins and then grumble at the crowd anyhow that doesn't affect his looks and he shan't be like a hungry bone anyway magda was still indignantly reminiscent of the handsome dentist oh his looks won't matter you will be far too much in love with his brutality i can't bear being made love to in the morning said alma with great candour i want gaslights and surroundings and things i shouldn't care for a man who only made love because the atmosphere intoxicated him protested hilda i should always doubt its reality the next morning that is just what flair and i mean though we don't want him bothering round the next morning. We are tired and practical until the lamps are lit. But that is because we are nous autres, Beatrice suggested, her voice floating out of her dusky corner like a song. When Beatrice spoke, people were first conscious of her personality, but she had a way of keeping long silences. I don't fancy that the real girls have the same morning reaction that is forced on us i'm too old to alter now said flair magda must risk her inartistic young man if she will only don't bring him round to me to be congratulated before four p m magda the cushion which magda aimed at her missed its mark and hit beatrice who had risen inoffensively to help herself to claret and soda it is but fair to nous autres to say here that they did not drink wine in the ordinary sense of the word flair caldecott after endless ailments drove her distracted doctor into ordering it if she could possibly afford it she was a delicate girl with a poor circulation which was at the root of other growing weaknesses and he had to contend with the germs of half a dozen diseases inherited from an ancestry of which he knew nothing so flair went without any etceteras to her meals and bought a horrible kind of wine at a shilling a bottle which eked out cost her no more than if she drank beer and injured her digestion even more she called it claret and nous autres contributed a certain amount of pence to supply the same stuff at their irregular meetings beatrice when the cushion hit her tucked it under her arm with an inscrutable smile and continued her progress 
to the packing-case sideboard then she carried both tumbler and cushion back to her chair and made herself comfortable she was a very slight girl with too much dark hair for her white face and gloomy eyes out of which a very hungry soul stared at a world which had fed it as sparingly as her thin young body beatrice was the youngest of the party but she had been keeping herself by the drudgery of uncongenial teaching ever since a charitable institution turned her out with the stereotyped education it bestows on the daughters of men who have shirked all responsibility with regard to them by dying well i do like that said magda with mock indignation beatrice has taken the cushion which ought to be extinguishing flare at this very moment talum imbele sina ictu said flare which freely translated means that you're a beastly bad shot magda go on trix tell us some more about the real girls don't they ever have reactions of course not because they have the right to be happy how softly ironical a young voice can be the gas was over beatrice's head and threw strange shadows of her heavy hair about the childish roundness of her face if she had not been so horribly young it might have sounded tolerable we have lost it you know if we are happy nusotra you may be certain we have stolen it snatched at something we want yes said alma thoughtfully taking a fresh cigarette it's always stolen that's true and you go into a corner and play with it under the rose we've both been happy in that way haven't we winnie yes dear and enjoyed it like all stolen violets i don't care for a thing i can't parade in broad daylight said hilda quickly it isn't happiness it's excitement and distraction i want something of my own that no one in the world dare question but we must have some distraction protested magda no human being can live as flair tries to do and make the work everything flair writes verse and the kind of tale she loves and that she can't sell when she wants a rest from pot-boiling it can't go on it's like feeding a dog with his own tail say a cat and i won't quarrel with you said flair lazily the vet told me r l could live on himself for a fortnight he is so well nourished well you can't do it for long i know you will break down you had much better go to earl's court with the young man you designed for me he would probably be a decent fellow and it wouldn't matter any more than if you went with another girl if we take our distractions openly said frank honestly it means that we must accept as escort the men who are round about us the class with which our daily life brings us in contact what is the use of flinching from a grade that we consider in our hearts is just below us the men whom winnie calls not quite are our social equals through stress of circumstances it is no good fretting after a class which belongs to the real girls are you cold beatrice hilda said kindly for the youngest member of the party had shivered not physically said beatrice briefly winnie shivered too i felt it all across the room and flair set her teeth you are quite right frank we are all more or less on the level of shop girls and should be content to walk out with shop boys if we insist on knowing gentlemen we must do so illegitimately and then they will treat us like shop girls all the same look at hilda said flair laughing her fighting blood is up at the notion tell us your view of the real girls and their advantages hilda the real girls said hilda with a little resentful laugh have time to be dainty if there is one thing i resent on fate it is the hurry it costs to earn one's bread and butter i could turn myself out so well if i might live a little slower anyhow you never look anything but lovely apollo hilda's profile had gained her the nickname of the apollo belvedere amongst nusotra so perhaps it is as well for the peace of mankind 
that you have not time to enhance your charms i wonder whether the real girls have ever had to spoil their hands for lack of attention it takes five to ten minutes to get them really clean in london after a morning's work and we are mostly allowed half an hour for feeding time washing being included i should like to have my clothes mended for me like a man said frank no affectionate landlady comes to us and offers to sew the buttons on our shirts when we have ended our male day in the office we have to go home and begin our female day unless we have lost our sense of feminine decency and go in rags i should be thankful to read in the evenings and forget myself and my own life for a while though i don't hanker after extra work like flare but there are always a pile of domestic duties that have grown during the day you are a saint frank but it is not all of us who have a home life at all we have to cook our own dinner though even if we live in rooms put in magda ruefully oh how sick i get of it i should often go without food at the end of a day if it were not for deb it is bad for her and so i have to insist on supper why is it that these things are not done for us can you fancy a man living in rooms and cooking his own meals some of them do some of them go to eating-houses where we could not swallow the food i suppose it costs too much to make an arrangement with your landlady to do for you generally we went into that when deb and i joined forces and the other way is cheaper no we cannot afford to be comfortable nous autres the men are always better off than we somehow they don't mend their own table linen and clean their own plate for another thing i don't fancy they have such things said hilda honestly if a man lives in rooms and by himself he does away with all such graces of life unless he is rich it's a bald existence and one we will not endure ourselves so as we will have the home luxuries and refinements after which we hanker we pay for it in extra labour that is all i shall pay for it if i don't begin to get home said frank jumping up it's early duty to-morrow i have to leave our house by ten minutes past seven i used to think it hard when i had to be down to breakfast at seven fifteen in my last school said beatrice opening her big eyes what an awful life when do you go off duty frank oh at four of course if you begin earlier you end earlier the eight hours act sees to that good-bye flare look after yourself old girl you are growing thin i am growing old said flare carelessly it's my birthday next wednesday will you congratulate me i will heartily said magda with no intention of being pathetic for it means that you have got through another year and have one less to live and that's the truest reason for congratulation i'm sorry i shan't see you on wednesday flare but we make up that day yes i feared it was hopeless to ask you i am going to just come in and look at you said alma in her purry purry voice she was a small person with an infinite capacity for mothering other and more angular people even flare smiled a wintry smile upon her blandishments all right she said will you come to luncheon alma declined quite rightly though she did not know it flare's idea of luncheon consisted in three mutton sandwiches and a banana always washed down by the cheap claret i have lunched with her and i ought to know this however was not alma's reason for declining though it should have been she had had a call to try voices for a musical comedy which necessitated her going to the south side of london at an unearthly hour and probably getting no meal at all but we ought to be three by three she said hopefully i'll come in on the way home and borrow a cup of tea flare i'll get some sausages and we will toast them said flare thoughtfully you will have no lunch i know so you may as well have something more substantial than bread and butter that's right look after her said hilda with her soft quick laugh a laugh that always had an echo of irony in it even when she was least ironical because life had struck her as a sorry jest 
and she had learned to treat it as bitter humour lest she should weep over it good-bye my child she patted flair's curly head from her loftier height and linked her arm in alma's beatrice kissed flair in silence but was held back till winnie had followed magda and frank into the passage how's the music master said flair breathlessly the expression went out of beatrice's face in a curious fashion she made her brown eyes blank and stared at flair as if she locked a secret behind closed doors oh very well i think she spoke in the congratulatory tone of one who assures another of the health of an acquaintance flair sighed this was worse than winnie's luncheon party frankly whispered all right he is sometimes in a bad temper that was why i asked she said good-humouredly beatrice hesitated the silence which seemed to have fallen on her during the long lonely years at the charitable institution developing very slowly into a faint smile it was like the twilight of a smile and hardly lifted the corners of her lips flair waited as usual if one did not ask beatrice she would sometimes speak he was very nice yesterday she said in the best music of her voice when it remembered happy things when we put away the music together after the lesson was over there was another pause r l rose on the table and yawned as a hint to flair that he wished to go to bed beatrice turned suddenly and kissed the baby rings of hair that lay most incongruously over flair's broad masculine forehead good-night she said softly and vanished after the others their voices and steps died down the passage some one whistled a bar of berlioz faust then good night alas from ill hap who shall stay thee and winnie laughed the front door shut with a bang and darkness seemed to settle once more on the gaunt house with a certain weariness in her very movements the one girl left alone collected the personal belongings she had brought down for the meeting took down the placard with news ultra from the door and carried the lamp up the six flights of stairs after her fourth journey she looked round inclusively and saw that all signs of their presence were removed then she lifted the sleepy cat and settled him on her left arm like a baby his limp paws hanging over her shoulder the solid weight of his great body making her pant a little before she reached her own quarters but before she actually left the big room downstairs she paused a minute looking backwards and forwards the old expectancy returning to her face and haunting her eyes horrible eyes in which the wisdom and sins and experiences of ten centuries seemed to have suffered resurrection a clock struck ten from a neighbouring church as she stood there it was early for the london world but late for nuzotra who lie down that they may rise and live through to-morrow and so on through countless to-morrows all shading towards a universal greyness of middle age or a tragedy of poverty-stricken years that end in merciful death it is the portion to which news ultra look if they dare to look at all flair caldicott turned out the gas lamp and the stove and went slowly up those many stairs to the attic under the roof End of chapter one